Happy New Year. I don't think I've made a video yet in 2025, but I wanted to come back from the December conference, the SABCS, San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium Conference that I went to and give a little summary of my favorite presentation there. I think I might make another video or two of some other topics and things that I learned there, but for today, I really wanted to touch on the most exciting study that I've heard of in all of my years of looking at studies of breast cancer. It's a study that was still open when I was diagnosed and I really wanted to be admitted to the study. And I wasn't because my DCIS had progressed a little bit too much. By the time I had a biopsy that actually detected it, I wasn't eligible any longer, but I still want to teach others about this study, not because you can actually enter it anymore. I think it's closed, pretty sure it's closed, but I think you'll really value the story behind it and following it to see what the longer term results are. This was the two year mark, so they showed up this year just to give preliminary findings. And so it wasn't like a huge, exciting revelation because two years is not very long for any study to show findings. It's not long enough really to get too excited about anything. And they weren't claiming that they had found anything too exciting, but they just were showing up to give an update and to tell people about it because that SABCS is kind of where you show up to tell people about exciting studies. So COMET stands for Comparing Operation or Surgery to monitoring with or without endocrine therapy. So let me unpack that first. Um, it's looking at two different subject groups. They're randomized, so this is a really high quality trial. They're randomized to two groups. One is active monitoring and one is surgery uh, to follow low grade DCIS. So this is not advanced uh, active DCIS. This is the slower moving, more suspicious, but not scary DCIS. So it's the 50% of us women that get diagnosed with DCIS and have a biopsy, we are graded in the lower, lower grade. Uh, it's kind of like an abnormal cell more than an actual potential carcinoma is the thinking behind it. And the two groups, both of the groups can or may choose not to engage with endocrine therapy. So this trial opened in 2017, it closed in 2023. In 2017, endocrine therapy was not very commonly given to folks who were at risk of breast cancer or DCIS, um, but it was an option. And so I think they designed the trial knowing that endocrine therapy would become more and more popular for this kind of pretreatment. And it definitely has. So it's good that they designed the trial to include the possibility of endocrine therapy. So they set up the study so that folks would have the choice to take endocrine therapy if they would like to, and like many of us do, some of those patients would end up dropping out of their endocrine therapy because of all the side effects of that therapy, which I'm really glad for. I'm glad that they um, set it up to capture all of those different populations. The fact is DCIS is super common nowadays. Over 50,000 women each year get diagnosed with DCIS. And the reason for this study is that they have found through doing autopsy studies, especially in Europe, that some people, especially with early grade DCIS, the lower, less threatening, less scary kind, those people can live on the rest of their entire lives with DCIS intact in their ducts and their breasts without any harm, uh, without any cancer growing. Uh, I don't know how they established that. I haven't looked into the details of that study. The main one was done in the UK. But it was established that a woman who in her 40s or 50s got DCIS, in many cases could live to be in her 80s or 90s, and die with the same DCIS intact without it growing or becoming invasive. Now just the title of DCIS involves the C, which stands for carcinoma, which really scares a lot of patients that are diagnosed with this. When I was diagnosed with this, I had already looked into it and studied it a lot and understood that it is not that scary, especially in the early stages. I wasn't scared by it at all. I was probably one of those unique patients that didn't get scared by it. But like my recent podcast guest, Christina Miner, who is the host of her own podcast, Our Scar Speak, 
She tells in her podcast her story of hearing that word carcinoma when she was diagnosed with DCIS, which stands for ductal carcinoma in situ, which means ductal carcinoma that sits still in the duct. She heard the word carcinoma as part of her diagnosis, and she thought, cancer, I have cancer. And after that, she couldn't hear anything else. She just knew that she wanted to get this cancer out of her breast. Well, other women who have looked into DCIS before being diagnosed with it, like myself, are not as much in a hurry to get rid of their breast tissue or sacrifice their breasts, knowing that in England, a lot of women lived with this intact in their breast for the second half of their lives, and it didn't kill them. It didn't even threaten them. So doctors like Shelley Huang, who has authored this study, this Comet study, were really interested in getting to the bottom of this because in the U.S. we have an aggressive response to any DCIS, which most surgeons will say, we need to do a lumpectomy or a mastectomy in response to DCIS. Dr. Huang thought that was a little bit of an overreach. That was maybe a little too much to start taking women's breast tissue away when this diagnosis possibly was not a long-term threat to them. So she wanted to look at that, and the best way to look at that is comparing surgery to active monitoring and over a long period of time looking at outcomes, looking at the threat comparing the active monitoring to the surgery and maybe even possibly the harms of surgery, I guess, is the implication, although I don't think they, they have stated that anywhere. It's possible that um, the, the harms of surgery could be an element as well that might come out in the end. Now this study is only scheduled to be spanning 15 years at this point. Hopefully they will get permission from all the subjects in this study to follow them for much longer than that. I would like to see it last 30 or 40 years, ideally, because I am interested in the long-term implications of monitoring versus surgery. But for now, they've just promised to study these women, follow these women for 15 years. So far, in the first two years of the study, they found that women who did get surgery in response to their diagnosis of early stage or low grade DCIS, there was a 6% population that had invasive cancer as well that was unbeknownst to the person that did um, the pathology. So pathology after biopsy will look to see if there's invasive cancer. If there's no invasive cancer, the diagnosis would still be DCIS, which is usually pretty visible without a biopsy. But once in a while, you will have a, a biopsy going in and you'll find DCIS and invasive cancer. Well, those who had surgery, some of them also found invasive cancer that had not been detected on the biopsy. And so the implication is that 6% of the active monitoring group would also potentially have invasive cancer as well. And so that alone is something interesting to look at that, you know, just in the initial stages of the half of the population or the subject group that chose surgery over active monitoring, 6% of those women did have invasive cancer. So that alone shows that there is some reason to be worried about DCIS. Sometimes it comes with invasive cancer. That was true of myself as well. We were not able to see my invasive cancer until we took out all of my DCIS, the whole breast, and then there was two millimeters of tiny, tiny bit of invasive cancer in there as well that was totally undetected prior to surgery. A tricky part of this study, and one of the things that was criticized in the debate or discussion after the presentation down in San Antonio, was that in this study, there were many participants that decided not to take part in the randomized group that they were assigned to. So like myself, if I had been allowed to participate in this study, I would have absolutely insisted on being in the active monitoring group because I am all about the conservative approach to treatment, always. That's just my MO. And there are women that are all about the risk reduction um, part of treatment and they would want to go for the most aggressive kind of treatment like my friend Christina Miner who uh, was my my recent guest on my podcast she said get it all out I don't care what it is just get it out of here and I think more women do err on the side of caution 
but I was one of those that would have insisted on being in the active monitoring group. But since this study is randomized, the way all good studies are, if they at all can be, a lot of women would have ended up in the group that they didn't want to be in, probably on both sides. And what they decided to do was to still follow those women and include them in the study, kind of in the margins of the study, even though they did not adhere to uh, the group that they were assigned to. So that was a criticism of the study. And so they made it really clear that those women were outside of the randomization part of the study and they're keeping them separate. This is the trouble with any study. Like if you want to get into a study that is uh, not a drug study, I mean, most people want to get into a drug study because there's a potential of getting the drug even though they're not sure whether they're getting it. It's blinded. This is not a blinded study. This is one where you pretty much know whether you've had surgery or not, right? Like you can't really blind somebody from, well, you can. You can pretend to go in and have surgery, but they didn't do that in this case. So, you know, the gold standard for all studies is that it would be blinded. This one is not, but it is randomized. The other thing that is complicated in this study is that all women on both sides were given a chance to take endocrine therapy, which is very likely to reduce any kind of potential abnormal cell or estrogen-fed cell. And any low-grade DCIS is going to be estrogen-fed. The, um, the ones that are missing the estrogen receptors or the ones that are triple negative would be ineligible for the study to begin with. So these are women that are potentially benefiting from endocrine therapy. So that muddies the water a little bit, but it's impossible to take that element out now that we are very commonly offering women endocrine therapy. I think the only really muddy area is really tracking whether or not they did take it long term and when they stopped taking it. So that'll be interesting to look at long term. So about a thousand women were recruited for this study and about half of them were in each group. So half of them have already had their surgery, uh, whether it was lumpectomy or mastectomy, they had their surgery to remove all visible DCIS and they'll be followed on that end of the study. Uh, long term, at least 15 years, and the other half of the women have not yet had surgery, and they may have surgery if their low grade DCIS progresses to higher grade DCIS, which typically they, some of them will, and we'll see percentages coming out in the following years as they report out on their annual statistics and data that come out of the study. But in the end, we'll be able to see relatively clearly what the difference is and whether or not the women who did have surgery on the first year of this study really needed to sacrifice their breasts this early in their story. There's no questioning that some of the women with low grade DCIS will progress to higher grade. I mean, it's clear even at the beginning of the, the study, they found that 6% did progress even before surgery to invasive cancer. So there is that possibility and no one's denying that. But as an overall practice, the world is watching to see whether or not surgery should be the first kind of response to a diagnosis of DCIS, and especially this low-grade DCIS. I don't think there's any question that higher-grade DCIS is threatening and it should be given surgery. Uh, if, if you're in that zone, which I was in, by the time they found a really good biopsy sample in me, I had already progressed to higher grade DCIS and there was no question that surgery was the answer for me. I didn't understand that exactly uh, at that point and that's the reason we need this study because without this study to illustrate how important surgery is, it's hard for the patient population to go in and get really clearly educated, especially when you're looking online, because half of the surgeons in the world are saying DCIS is scary, and the other half of the surgeons in the world are saying DCIS isn't scary, and I fell prey to that confusion. And the reason I'm making DCIS videos here on my channel is to lessen that confusion, and I wanna make sure that you see an even more important video of mine that talks about the place in time at which DCIS does become scary, when it becomes less low grade and more high grade, where there is something on a biopsy report called comedonecrosis. So I have a whole video about that and I will link to it up above as well as down below. But there's a lot of confusion in the world and in the online space, especially 
If you look at Facebook groups about DCIS, half of them are saying it's a horrible thing. Actually, probably less than half of them. Most of them are saying it's a, not a problem at all and it's not cancer. Well, it's true. It's probably not right to say it is cancer, but it's also not right to say it's not cancer. It's this gray area. It's abnormal cells that are potentially cancer that could become cancer. And I think all the surgeons in the world agree on that definition. And the more they're studying things, they also agree on the fact that the comedonecrosis point is the point at which it becomes aggressive and dangerous and you need to get it out. But we as patients looking online don't always see that part of the story. And so this study has the promise to clarify that in a really public way. Hopefully this study will get a lot of airtime with different surgeons and all the surgeons will become united around what is really true about DCIS. And that's why I'm so excited. And this was my favorite study that was presented in San Antonio last year, last month in 2024. I'm probably not the person to ask questions about this study. Uh, Shelly Huang at Duke University is the person you would want to address your questions to. So I will not say, please come and ask me questions about this study. I will not have the answers to it. But I really encourage you to keep watching this study. Um, you know, save it on your bookmarks on, you know, Duke University's website, which I will link below in the show notes. And just keep in touch with me and keep watching my videos. And over the years, I will definitely be updating you on the data and the results found in this really intriguing study that I think is being done really well. A lot of reputable scientists showed up in December and gave Dr. Huang a lot of kudos for doing this study very, very well. Um, some people that are highly respected in the breast cancer space. There were a couple that were also skeptical, of course, because this is a really controversial issue. But I think it'll be fun to watch over the years, and I can't wait till we get to that 15-year point and see what the final results of the study are. So I hope you'll be with me still then, and I hope I'll be with you still then here on YouTube. But follow the study in the meantime at the Duke University website. And I'll see you in my next video.